الحمد لله الحمد لله نستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا فمن يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله ارسله بالحق بشيرا ونذيرا اللهم صل على سيدنا ومولانا وحبيبنا محمد النبي الامين محمد النبي الامي الهاشمي الصلاه والسلام عليه وعلى اله واصحابه ومن تبعهم باحسان الى يوم الدين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقهوا قولي We have covered glimpses of the lives of Holy Prophet sallallahu alaihi wa sallam alternatively in a few khutbas in the past. I'm purposely using the word glimpses because the life, the life of Holy Prophet sallallahu alaihi wa sallam is so beautiful, so vast. It is hard to hold and understand each and every moment of that life. We are thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that so much about his life is preserved in the books. which is not true for any other prophet of God. So we are blessed as an ummah that we could read so much about our beloved prophet sallallahu alaihi wa sallam, several references in the Quran, several references in the ahadith, several references in the books of history, in the books prior to Quran, and it's unbelievable the amount of information that's out there. Today we're going to talk about something different. Today we're going to talk about the ulama, their mentions in the Quran and in the Sunnah, and why are they important. The word ulama is the plural of the word alim, which is an Arabic word which means the one who is knowledgeable. The root word is ilm, that means the knowledge. Now the word ilm or the knowledge is a very generic word, which applies to any kind of a knowledge that you may seek in this world. However, after the coming of Islam, the word alim or ulama became specifically for that person who is knowledgeable in the religion of Islam. So now the term alim or ulama specifically applies to that context. So when we are reading Quran from that perspective, we have in our mind that particular definition of the word alim. So we'll see today However much the time permits, the little bit of references from the Holy Quran that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how high he holds the ulama, and then Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and how much the people of the past weighed knowledge, the knowledge about the religion, which is of secondary importance to us for some reason, as a primary importance is something else, whatever it is. Similarly, the ulama has also taken the back seats in our life, As every day, we after reading a couple books become the alim ourselves. So there are a lot of things that we need to look back and see what we are doing wrong and go to the right set of sources to find the answers. So first of all, we need to understand the alim is the person who is knowledgeable in religion Islam. Now Islam is a very, very vast area. It's not like a person who gives the adhan is probably have a longer beard, we would go and ask him about the, the, the Masail, the Fatawas, the jurisprudence. He may not know it. So if he doesn't know it, people start making fun of him. The person who leads the prayers may not actually be an alim himself to, in all the areas. Islam is very vast. Even in the Sahaba, there are so many of them, as we talked about in the past, in the last khutbah that Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam delivered, there were over 124,000 people there. But among them, the ulama were handful. And even the ulama had very specific areas that they would talk into. Hadrat Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu was a master in jurisprudence. Hadrat Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala anhu was master of the understanding of the hadith. Ubay ibn Ka'ab radiallahu ta'ala anhu was the master of the qira'ah. So they had their expertise. The people would go to the people of expertise to ask about the matters. Those were the kind of things back then, those are the kind of things today. Now from my life experience, I go to ulama for tafasir. So that I want to learn it from them. Sometimes learning the entire surah's tafsir from one alim, I'm not fully satisfied. 
So I go to another alim to read the same surah under his command. And another horizon opens up. Then I go and sit with another alim and say, okay, now let's see another horizon of understanding this. Because the life of Holy Prophet wasallam, the understanding of the Qur'an, you keep reading it, you get keep involving in it. That's only the step one. Then bringing that involvement into your life and implementing it is actually the real truth behind it. And that's also not the final step. The final step is keep working on it till the last breath. That is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala constantly says in the Holy Quran, وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا Those who embrace Islam, وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ And has been constantly doing the good deeds till the last breath. And then they meet their Lord such that رضي الله عنهم ورضوا عنه They are happy with Allah and Allah is happy with them. These are the kind of people Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that الْجَنَّةِ These are the kind of people who actually, really, truly belong as the inhabitants of the Jannah. Why Jannah is our inheritance? Because it was given to our father Adam alayhi salam. We need to get the Jannah back. How do we get the Jannah back? You've got to work hard for it. That's the only way. And working hard is not easy. Well, look at the fajr time. Varies from 3 in the morning till 7.20. <coughs> Such a variation. Keeping constantly getting up early in the morning despite the fact when you slept last night is itself is an effort. But you get rewarded for your effort. That's the bottom line. So let's look at one of the first verses from Surah An-Nisa. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about, about the ulama. And this is a very generic word at worst, and I'm going to step by step go and look into this in steps. The first one. Ya amanu. Oh, those of you who have embraced Islam, what should you do? Allah. Obey Allah. This is the highest level of following somebody. Obeying. You probably are familiar with fan following. That happens a lot around here or any place in the world. But fan that reaches a point of obedience. That whoever he is following, whatever they say, they got to do it. That's the level Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from us. Allah. Well, we can't talk to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directly. So what should we do? The next verse says, Obey the Prophet, because he has the word of God. In another place in the Quran, Allah says, whatever he says, he doesn't say it out of his own will. Whatever he says is what we tell him to say. The person who is that regarded and commanded, even in the matter of saying, we got to obey this person. It says divine intervention in every action of this person. Okay, well, Prophet is not forever to be around. Prophet has to die. Or, during his time, the Prophet was not everywhere. Prophet would appoint governors, like Ma'ad ibn Jabal, Jabal ta'ala, who was made the governor of the Yemen. Ali ta'ala, who was sent out with an authority, there were generals who would go out in the field. So now what should we do? Atiyah Allah and Atiyah Rasul is with us. But now if we have to make more, then what should we do? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Wa ulil amri minkum. Those who have been made authority among you has to now make a decision on your part. Now the word authority is very generic here. If you look at the city, there is a mayor of the city, there is an authority in the city. The lawmakers in the city, there is a judge in the city. When it comes to the law enforcement, you've got to follow and appreciate the law enforcement as your authority. When you go into education, the educational institution is an authority. But when you come to religion, them are the authority. Why are fate shaken then? Why not shakes in the other matters? That level of trust needs to be built. And it all lies here. 
because we have built this ego in ourselves. Oh, this guy can't speak English that well, so how can he tell me about Islam? Well, he knows Arabic pretty well, by the way. He knows the Hadith pretty well, by the way. He knows the Tafasir pretty well, by the way. So we need to humble down in ourselves. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions about these people that Allah, His Prophet, and then, وَأُولِي الْأَمْرِ مِنْكُمْ Now let's go to Surah Ali Imran. Beautiful. Imam Ghazali alayhi, says that look at the beauty of this, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned three things. Himself and two other categories. When he says these are the kind of people who really truly understand me. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, شَهِدَ اللَّهُ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّهُ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the witness himself. That there's nobody to be worshipped except him. And among his creation, who? وَالْمَلَائِكَةِ And the angels. And angels are without any self-consciousness, any, any nafs. So they have to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because the moment they are created, they are saying his, seeing his presence. Now comes the really important group Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Those people that have been given the knowledge. That's the third category. Now comes the question, well, the scientists have the knowledge. The mathematicians have the knowledge. All these doctors and surgeons have the knowledge. So what kind of knowledge Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about? Now look at it like this. A person, despite of all his knowledge or her knowledge, despite of all their research, if they cannot see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His glory, the knowledge is useless. You go out there every day, you do your research, you do the bombardment of atomic particles on this plate to see the movement of the atom, yet you don't see the deity who created the atom. You do all these chemical reactions. You go into your labs and build computers, but the computer itself uses so many things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us like gold and titanium and copper. Where does it all come from? Despite all this knowledge, if you cannot see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then that knowledge is of no use. So which knowledge is of use? The knowledge that can actually take you to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because Allah says, Shahid, witnesses, his deity, his presence. So that's the second fold into the picture. The third fold, Surah Al Mujadila. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Those who embrace Islam, what is their place? <laughs> After coming to Allah, because they have shahid, they have witnessed His presence, they have embraced Islam, so now they are one step higher than those who have not embraced. But once again, as amanu, as the believers, we should still be keeping ourselves humble. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that their darajah, their rank is higher, but that rank should not make into our ego system and we start judging people around. That's wrong. So we should not apply these statements on our egos. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, يَرْفَعَ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raises them among you and among those who believe, وَالَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْعِلْمَ دَرَجَاتِ And among those who believe, those who have the knowledge are even of a higher stature. Now let's unfold and go to the fourth category, Surah Al-Fatih. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, how will you judge these ulama? There are a lot of people out there with degrees and stuff. Right? There has to be some way of litmus paper to see, okay, this guy fulfills it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, <laughs> If it's a true alim, we'll have a fear of Allah. Now let's understand the fear here. It's not the fear which is khawf. Hawf is also translated as fear. That is another thing in the English language or any other language that you translate Quran into that you don't get the true gist of it. Hawf is a different kind of fear. Yaksha is a different kind of fear. Yaksha has a love. Like the same kind of love a child has. Three-year-old, two-year-old, 
which is his love is pure, and he looks at his parents, and whatever he's doing, he stops doing it because he knows that they get mad. I don't want to make them mad. No intention, no other reason. This is a pure love. That's yaksha. That's pure love, because we want to produce in ourselves, because we are so tainted. We have been gone so bad, so out of the way. So we need that coming back. And who's going to help us come back? Of course, those people who practice this already. So when we started, I told you that inshallah we were going to be talking about this in the light of the Quran and in the light of the Hadith. We, because of the time of limitations, do not have time to cover up everything that we want to cover up. So that's how I've been doing from past several Jummahs. Then I divide up the topic in multiple Jummahs and continue. So inshallah we were going to continue to explore these things from the light of Hadith, the importance of ulama, and what are the kind of things that a normal person, when he goes through certain things, doesn't see, but when he sits with an alim, he makes him see these pearls of knowledge. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina wa Mawlana Muhammadin Nabi al-Amin al-Kareem Rabbi qfirli wa liwalidhi Rabbi qfallana wa liwalidhina wa liman dakhla fi buyutina wa umina wa lilmuminina wa lilmuminat Allahumma qfirlana wa liyazwadina wa dhuriyatina qurrata ayuni wa ja'alna lilmattaqina imama Rabbana atina fi dunya hasanatan wa fi al-akhirati hasanatan wa fi al-adhaab al-nar Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa aqim al-salah